They're wonderful, aren't they? They are a true gifts from the Lord. Amen. Well, I appreciate everybody being here. And I've been looking forward to this. It's interesting how when you start to prepare for a sermon, and I thought, you know, I knew, I thought I knew what the Lord wanted, right? I think we messed that up a lot. I'm good at it. So I started, and I, I had an idea, and I was running with it, and then all of a sudden, the Lord kind of steered me in a different direction. And I, I kind of followed it, and he just put it on my heart. So that's where this message that we're going to came from today. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. And probably what you heard me talking to kids, the interesting thing is Matthew means gift of the Lord, or gift from the Lord. Uh, most of us probably remember the interesting thing. This is, you know, one of the four Gospels, but Matthew, he was the, he was the tax collector, right? His other name was Levi. But generally, that only got brought up or referred to when they talked about his sinful past, or he did. He often quotes, Matthew, he often quotes the Old Testament, and he actually does it more than 60 times. And he emphasizes how Christ was the fulfillment of the promises there. But the interesting thing is, is we, you know, there's always seems to be a debate about New Testament, Old Testament. But just as Jesus, you know, he quoted the Old Testament, Matthew did. And it, it, what it does is it confirms the importance that it still applies and it still matters to us. You know, the Matthew's Gospel is where we find the Sermon on the Mount, right? Chapter 5 through 7 and you know, we know it was Jesus' longest sermon. And it was an explanation of what it looked like to be a follower of Christ and a member of the kingdom. It served as kind of a radical wake-up call for the folks of that time. And, and it's considered history's greatest sermon. And although, you know, like you heard me maybe mention to the kids, the beginning of it, or through most of his sermon, it carries the theme of righteousness. But about halfway through seven, he adds in salvation. And when you're looking at it in, uh, in seven and 13, he talks, you know, we've got the narrow and the wide gates. And then in 15, we hit the, the tree and it's few. And there's a bunch of sermons that can be dug out from that. But today, what I really want to do is look towards the end of this tremendous sermon. Next slide, please. And we're going to be in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And if you don't have it, mine I actually have, and, and you can remind you that it's the Red Letter Bible, uh, or my Bible's the Red Letter Bible, meaning that we see these words are actually Jesus' words. So I think that applies uh, some extra meaning for us and importance. So if you would, would you please stand with me for the reading of his word? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Fathers, we gather to you today. I just ask for your mercy, your grace, Lord. I know that we don't deserve it. I pray that my words are your words, that you send your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, to guide us, that we might be receptive of the word that you've placed on my heart today, and that it touches us, and that we that you are glorified and that we honor and praise you in a manner that's pleasing unto you. In Jesus Christ, in our Father's name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Next slide, please. You know, I was thinking about it and I, I, I decided to title this, Not Me. And the reason why is because I think the first indication is as we look at this and we say, that's not me. Or, maybe it really isn't us, but I'm saying, not me, I ain't got to worry about it. I ain't got to worry about my friends, my family, my fellow human beings. The interesting thing is, is that, you know, we have our scripture here and God gives us all kinds. But 
we have a serious warning right here. And what do we like to do with warnings? I think it's interesting because we like to test those, don't we? I don't know what it is about us, but we like to test those. To, I mean, think about the easiest thing, and I'm guilty of it, guys. It's speed limit, right? Speed limit is 55. What do we do? 60. 60. Five over. Five over. Or what do we do? Or if you know, man, if it, the cop's got the, he can go all the way to nine. So let me push that to nine. Who does 54? Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> one man. One. One. We got one righteous man. But see, that's what we do. We have a tendency. We want to go right up to that line and test it. We want to put our toe right there. You know, go like this, huh? And we, and we like to walk that line. But in verse 21, he starts off and he says, not everyone. What the heck, God? What do you mean, not everyone? I thought you were all loving, right? I mean, but the thing is, is this is pretty straightforward. He says right there, not everyone. Said, what, you know, what does that mean? Not everyone. That's the truth. You know, everybody is going to have a chance. Everybody, every one of us is going to have the opportunity. But it's not, it's not the lottery. Everyone can win. But you can't buy it. And you can't earn it. Slide, please. How many remember a few years ago, we had that great movie. The kids probably loved it. All dogs go to heaven, right? It was more than four years ago. I'm showing my age. All right. Are the kids still, are the kids still seeing it? Well, yeah. <laughs> You know, the thing is, is I guess maybe all the dogs get to go, go, but he's telling us not everyone. But today, we've got pastors and there's, you know, pop, you know, a bunch of popular ones and some authors. You know, they're declaring love wins in the end and no one actually goes to hell. They're even questioning its existence. I, I don't understand it. The, you know, they've actually got a name for this. I was surprised when I was, when I was studying and looking for this. And the name, uh, Christian Universalism. Christian Universalism. God exists and he's all loving. <coughs> so he wouldn't send anybody to hell. Or you've got the idea. How about most people were good, right? As long as I'm a good person, I deserve to go to heaven. Most people believe. Or they want to believe they're going to go to heaven because they don't want to consider the alternative. You know, I think one of the scariest comments that I've ever heard is, I hope. I hope I'm going to heaven. Folks, I'm here to tell you, and it tells you in God's word, you can't have assurance. We don't have to hope or wonder. <clears throat> We've probably heard this, you know, and there's all kinds of statistics and surveys out there, you know, as I was trying to answer God's call and look at things. And you've probably heard pastors say, some have said, you know, 40% aren't truly saved that are sitting in the church or 40% are. You hear all kinds of things. I was trying to find some honest to date info on it. Next slide, please. You know, one survey that was over 10 years ago indicated that 58% of Methodists, 60 Episcopalian, 54 Presbyterians, 35% Baptist, 22 uh, uh, Lutheran deny there's a specific place after death. And when I say that, the survey was talking about hell. They're denying there's hell. Those numbers. You know, the thing is, just because they deny it doesn't make it so. Amen. Just because we deny it doesn't make it so. Make it so. A survey back in 2020, I found this one. This is probably the most relevant one. I did a lot of research looking for it. And the Arizona, at least it was a Christian university, found that 35% of Americans have a traditional biblical view of salvation through Jesus Christ. 52%. Are we on? You got the next slide? Of that, Only half of Americans, 54%, believe that they will experience half, uh, heaven after they die. 15% say they don't know what's going to happen after they die. 13 said that there's no life after death. 8 
say that they're going to get reincarnated. Maybe they're hoping they're going to be the dog so that they get into heaven. I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. 8% uh, say that they're going to go to a purification place afterwards and then they'll get there. 2% believe that they're going to go to hell. Only 2%. At least they're honest. They're saying, I'm going to hell. I don't know why they would choose that or accept it. So only 2%. So that means the rest, 98% of us, the rest of us are going to make it. Right? But he says in his word, many. That sounds like a lot more than 2% to me. I don't know about you. We don't know what that's going to be. The interesting thing is, is when I was looking at this, you know, there's over 162 references in the New Testament of hell. And Jesus, Jesus makes 70 of them himself. You know, and we could do a whole study. I mean, we could do a lot of, you know, different things, looking at studying on hell, and the, you know, different words, Sheol or Agama or the Greek Hades. You know, I could do brimstone and fire. You're going to hell! If you drink, if you smoke, if you do, if you're not wearing the right clothes, you're going to... Jesus didn't do that, did he? I'm not going to do it. You know, but we know that there's a heaven to gain and a heaven to shine. But all you got to do, folks, is read his word right here. And he tells us. And we can trust that. You know, if you're looking back in verse in 21, he says, But he who does the will of my Father. Next slide, please. He who does the will of my Father. Now, remember, uh, if you were here, or maybe you weren't here when I was preaching um, last time, about prayer, and we talked about the moral and permissive will of God. But God's will is what it comes down to. And this is what he tells us. Those that do the will of his Father. You know, and I think the good starting point is Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. That's the starting point. That's the reality of it. Obedience to God's revealed will. That revealed will to us is, is, is the scripture. Studying his word and in prayer. His will is salvation of his children through Jesus Christ. That we're sanctified in our actions, in our thoughts, and avoiding immorality. We can find lots of scripture. It talks about it. 1 Peter 2.15 For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. That, that's simple. He's telling us right there, the will of God, do it right. You know, faith that says, but really does not do, isn't faith. It's unbelief. Think about that. Let me say that again. Faith that says, faith that says, but really does not do, isn't faith. It's unbelief. The thing is, is, we need to make sure that we don't misread uh, or misinterpret what Jesus is saying in our scripture. Works are not going to get us that meritorious promotion to heaven or salvation. But proper God-centered faith that produced, and it will produce, fruit of good works. It falls right in line with James 1.22. Prove yourself doers of the word, not merely hearers. Are we hearers or are we doers? You know, Jesus said, my father, and here. And it's interesting because this is the first time that he says, my father. And what he's doing, he's confirming who he is. He's telling us who he is, but he's also telling us his authority. He's telling them and he's telling us that he is the authorized representative of God and carries his authority. But what else is he telling us? Another aspect, he's also telling them, he's telling us that he's going to be sitting there at the final judgment, right? Next slide, please. Verse 22, he says, many will say to me, again, he says many, that's telling us not everyone. How many? I don't know. That 2%? But I get the feeling it's going to be a lot more than that. Or is it 40 but we get the hint again or the idea that we will be facing him or they will be facing him and answering to Jesus. Then he says, Lord, Lord. 
And yet again, Jesus is telling them and us who he is. But not only that, by using it, he uses it twice. And we can get the idea that these folks, when they're doing it, there's going to be some desperation and pleading in their voice, standing for in, in front of them. Lord, Lord. The other thing is, he says, Lord, what is a Lord? A Lord is somebody we serve, right? We're required to serve. Him. You know, the Hebrews, when they wanted to express intimacy or a personal bond or a very close relationship, they would repeat names twice. Now, I don't think it's kind of like when we hear Christina looking at Eric and shaking her head going, Eric, Eric, Eric. He gets three times. <laughs> Slide, please. You know, in the Old Testament, and God uses an exodus, he says, Moses, Moses. In Genesis, it's Jacob, Jacob. He calls Samuel, Samuel. In Acts, probably a different tongue, Saul, Saul. Probably what Eric heard. You know, the angel of the Lord in Genesis, he called Abraham twice. But probably the greatest example we have is in Matthew 27, uh, where Jesus is on the cross. And he says, cries out, my God, my God. Think about the intimacy of the relationship that he's illustrating for us. When we're looking in these verses, these folks are not claiming just to be void of, of, of works. But they've done great works. They're claiming great works, right? I mean, they've done prophecy, casting out demons, performing miracles. Who here can claim that one? Anyone? I mean, it's possible. Think about it for a moment. Prophecy or these things, they are rare and special, to be sure. But prophecy isn't just predicting the future. It's divine revelation, a spiritual message proclaiming truth in all different ways. And I'm, I'm not standing up here saying that, you know, I'm God's prophet, but there's religion, there are people out there that are saying that. We need to discern those things and test it. What else do we have going on here in verse 22? If you think about it, really, these folks, they're comparing themselves to Jesus, aren't they? I mean, all of those miracles was what Jesus was doing and performing. They're putting themselves on the same plane. They had great confidence in the things that they did in their works. But what does that reek of? What does that stink of? Pride. Bingo. Thank you, Sister Chris. Pride. That's exactly what it is. You know, many, they might have the outward appearance of, of, of being a Christian. You know, we may be baptized, maybe real Bible smart, satisfied with our state or our status. But we, we have to ask ourselves, are we really doing the will of our Father in heaven? Are we truly repentant? Do we truly believe in and love Jesus? Are we living holy and humble lives? You know, being saved is more than just a public profession. It's more than a facade. We have to practice our Christianity. We have to practice our Christianity. Amen. Practice being Christ-like. It, but it's, and I'm not saying, it's not easy. And as great and even spectacular as their, mics, their works might have been, what weren't they? They weren't genuine. They weren't honest. They weren't pure of heart. And thus, they didn't produce truly good works. You know, one thing that I find interesting when I was looking at this in, in verse 22, all of these things are external. What I mean is when I'm talking about, you know, prophecy, exorcism, miracle working, they can all be characterized as charismatic things. That, and those things lend a tendency. I don't want you to get that I'm saying all or, or, or most or, you know, but I think some of those things, I believe they have a tendency to cause or allow or even actually encourage this outward enthusiasm of grandiose behavior that is substituted for just plain obedience. Just plain obedience. 
You know, external demonstrations prove nothing. The, the person that screams amen the loudest or, or all the other kind of things or, or the things that we do, it proves nothing. The real question comes down to what's inside and what's the true nature of our heart. You know, I think we find a good example of this in John 11. Do you remember uh, Caiaphas? He prophesied, didn't he? If you don't remember or you don't know, he was the high priest that year. And what did he do? He prophesied Jesus was going to die for a nation. The interesting thing was that it was true, right? But it wasn't something that God put on his heart. You know, he, along with the other Pharisees, they were plotting for their own advantages. If you look a little back a little bit farther in, in chapter seven, back in chapter 7 and verse 18, we see talk about a bad tree can't produce good fruit. How true is that? You know, if we apply it to ourselves, what good fruit are we producing? We have to ask that question. How often are we producing for the Lord? Depending on, you know, where we're at with our walk with the Lord, you know, are we babes in Christ? Are we still on milk? Are you a meat eater? Are you a more mature question? I think the problem is, is a lot of us, we're still on milk. We like being on milk because we're dependent. We like being fed, and if I'm there, I don't have to do anything, right? We get comfortable with that. But are we producing daily, weekly, yearly, or worse? Maybe you're kind of like a cherry tree, a sweet cherry tree, only takes seven years to produce. Or maybe you're kind of like the sour cherry tree, but that one only takes five years. You know, there's an old saying, what's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. What's the next best time to plant a tree? Today. There you go. Today. Folks, we need to plant Jesus in our hearts today. And when we do that, we need to take care of it. We need to foster that relationship the same way you do a tree. Next slide, please. What do you need to do with the tree? You need to water it, right? Remember our scripture when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well? And he's going to give the living water so you never thirst again, right? you got to feed a tree. We can feed on God's word. It's right there for us. You have to prune a tree, right? Help shape, mold, grow, get rid of the things. For us, what do we have that we can cut out of our lives? It shouldn't be there. The tree needs sunlight, right? God and Jesus can shine through us if we allow them to take us out of the darkness and use us to shine light on others and help them grow, help us grow. And then finally, you have to protect a tree from disease. What is that disease? That's the sin in our lives. The things that we see, that we do, that we hear, that we don't need to, that corrupt it and kill that relationship. In verse 23, he says, then I will declare to them. The interesting thing, the word declare is homo legal. That's the Greek for it. And it's interesting when I was looking at this word, because what it means is to publicly declare. Publicly. I'm not just telling somebody in the privacy of a room where it's just you and I seeing that. He's going to publicly declare. And you think about the implications of what that is. The deeper meaning is to speak to a conclusion. Something that's very final. To declare or proclaim with finality. Next slide, please. He says, I never knew you. Jesus isn't recognizing them as one of his. Many is, you know, will claim or will are they claim or will claim an intimacy in a relationship. And Jesus isn't saying that is broken off. He's saying that it never existed. He's saying, I don't recognize you 
as one of my disciples. I don't acknowledge you as one of my followers. We become spiritual strangers to our Lord and Savior. I want you to think about what a shock it would be to hear that. It's abrupt. It's final. It's stark. We get told that we never had a relationship. Jesus is telling them and maybe us that we're ignorant of the nature of a real relationship with God and Jesus. You know, what's that saying? Ignorance is bliss. Have you ever considered that? Or maybe somebody sitting here has, that's hearing my voice has that philosophy. If I don't know, I don't have to worry about it, right? Problem is, there's that other saying. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? You know, Phil gets beat up on so much, I'm picking on Brother Eric today. So, Brother Eric, he went out and he got, he got drawn for a registered caribou hunt. He's finally getting, he's going to go try and, you know, have some success and shoot some. He hasn't had much success lately. And he gets himself this 400 plus class bull. 400 plus. He's like, I, praise the Lord, I'm going in the record books. I'm going, he get, takes it in, gets it measured. Only to find out that there was an emergency closure. And he says, I didn't, but I didn't know. I didn't know. They're not going to be handing them that nice certificate put on the wall. They're going to be handing them a ticket. Maybe you're listening to me and you're thinking, come on, Pastor Tom, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not ignorant. I know, I read, I study, I, I believe. That doesn't apply to me. I don't want anyone in the sound of my voice to hear those four words. The problem or the issue is all too often we like to deceive ourselves. We don't like to examine ourselves. I mean, who wants to look in that mirror? We don't like what we see. Or maybe we love what we see. Man, I look pretty good today, don't I? Got dressed up. I do this, I do that. But that's that nasty little sin. Or maybe I should say that big sin of pride rearing its ugly little head or big head. In the last half of in verse 23, he says, depart from me. What a sad day that would be, being separated from Jesus. Is that what we want? Think about it. Have you ever told somebody, now probably not to anybody here, but we've all got things in our closet, but maybe we've had it said to us, or maybe we have, but we've heard somebody say these things. Just leave. Just leave. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to know you. I don't want to think about you. I don't have time for you. I don't have a place for you. How painful. You're hearing it now. Think about how painful that sounds, doesn't it? You know, the thing is, departing from him, where does that leave us? I mean, where's Jesus? He's in heaven, right? The Father? If we are in heaven, that only leaves one place. That place is where there's the wailing and gnashing of teeth, the eternal lake of fire. Those are the two choices. Next slide, please. You who practice lawlessness. You know, it's interesting. I put them both up here. You know, I, I, I'm using the New American Standard. It's, it says practice. The King James says work. What are these? These are action words, right? They're verbs. Practice is to engage continually. Repetitive. That involves effort. King James uses the word work, work, labor for, engage in. Now, in the next part of this, we have the lawless, lawlessness and iniquity. The word, the Greek word for this is anemia. And it's interesting. The lawlessness is, says, contempt and violation of the law. Inequity, iniquity, let me pronounce that properly, and the King James you know, sometimes we look at the difference in some of the Bibles and the translations, but I almost like this one better, this word. Because if you look at the definition of what comes up under that, we see in, uh, wickedness, immorality, impropriety, evil, hence sin. 
Next slide, please. Do me a favor, turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John, so you're going to pass John, you're going to go almost to the back of your Bible there, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. I'm going to read this again. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. By reading this, what are we seeing or what are we finding? We're actually using, and, and when you're studying the Bible, we're actually using Scripture to help interpret Scripture, to ensure that we have a good understanding. When he says practices lawlessness, sin, it's the idea of making sin habitual. Practice. It's a habit. So are we practicing sin? We have to ask ourselves that question and look in the proverbial mirror. You know, the thing is, general, you know, genuine Christians, we still have a sinful disposition. When we fall, when, when we fell from grace, it's in our nature, our being, we're all going to sin. But the thing is, we need to confess those sins and repent. A truly born-again believer, follower of Jesus Christ, we have a built-in check valve. We have a guard against that habitual sin. It's because of the new nature that we have in Christ. Look a little bit farther with me down here. We're, we're right here. Let's go down to verse 9. No one who practices, or I'm sorry, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. The thing is, is he's talking about practicing sin. We're going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. He doesn't expect us to be perfect. The reason why Christians cannot practice sin is because it's incompatible with the laws of God. If you claim to be his, if we claim to be a follower, if we claim to be saved, and we claim to love him, we can't willfully and continually hurt him with our sinning. Next slide, please. In Romans 6, 12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Don't let sin reign. I'm not talking about slipping up and making mistakes. He's not talking about that. But it's not the focus of our lives. It's not continually sinning, doing the same thing over and over again. What's, what's the definition of that? Insanity? Our mortal bodies, when we're here on earth, this is where we are vulnerable. We allow our minds to be tempted with sinful lusts of all kinds, things that we see, uh, things that we see, things that we watch, things of the flesh. You know, parents today, you have your kids, or maybe you're a grandparent, and they've got your, you know, they're watching Disney or kids shows, cartoons, things like I was shocked. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this anymore, but I remember it, you know, the cartoon Arthur or Blues Clues. Indoctrinating our kids into worldly sins, telling them it's okay. As adults, we can't watch shows without seeing improper things. You know, I think I forget who I was talking to, and I'm guilty of this, folks. I'll tell you, I like movies. I like movies. I try not to, you know, go to any more of like the R's or things like that, but even less than that, I mean, you think about it. Things that we see. I, lo I like, and, and maybe I'm the only one, but who likes, you know, Marvel? You know, you see all of those. I, I watch them. But you think about it. What are they full of? Murder. Killing. And I was, I was thinking about it. God put it on my heart. Why is it I find killing, murdering, entertaining? That hit me hard. I'm trying to watch other movies. But it's hard. You know, when we read lawlessness, what is Jesus conveying? I really believe he's conveying more than just violating God's law. But really, what it is, it's an ultimate rebellion. 
living as if he, did, he didn't exist, and therefore his laws don't exist. That's what criminals do. That's what the world does. What sin do we have in our lives? We got the Ten Commandments, right? Our kids in, 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 in Bible study this morning, they were, they were working on the Ten Commandments, right, Chris, Nikki? Uh, Zeke was showing me his. The kids were putting them up. But, we, I mean, the, we got those. No other gods, right? Uh, no carved idols. You know, I'm not GD in it. I keep the Sabbath. Uh, you know, I honor mom and dad. I'm not a killer. You know, I don't kill anybody. I'm not cheating on my wife. I don't steal. I'm not bearing false witness. I'm not coveting. Those are easy ones. Well, maybe not for some of us. But you think about it, some of these things mean different things. Remember that Bible verse that says, if you've got hate in your heart, you've murdered. Maybe I'm not physically stealing, but I'm robbing somebody of their joy with my actions or words. And there's other things that you can look at. But what about not doing the right thing as a believer? We've got greed, hate, anger, or again, that nasty one, pride. Slide, please. John four se or, I'm sorry, James 4.17, Therefore, no one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. If we're not doing the right things, we know what God wants us to do as a Christian. We know it's the right thing. That's sin, folks. That makes it, that makes it harder. It's not so cut and dry. We just got those braces. Remind me the pastor was talking about it. What would Jesus do if we're trying to figure out what's the right thing? We have to look in that mirror and see what sins do we have in our lives. Think about in Matthew in 723, he says, depart from me. Where else do we see that? We actually see that in Matthew 25 in the judgment, right? He's got the, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. I wonder, Phil, is that where that old saying, you old goat came from? But in, first, in verse 41, he goes on and he says, To those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. How terrible, how awful, how heartbreaking would those final words be? The worst words you could ever hear. You know, the thing is, like I said before, I think we often deceive ourselves, thinking we're saved that we're part of the kingdom. We're saying what I'm doing is for him. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees, they had talents, they had gifts. They used them and performed them. They thought they knew what Jesus wanted, but in their arrogance and in their pride and in their sin, one very important thing was missing. A relationship. A relationship with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. What is ours? You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, the main thing that Jesus was trying to convey is for us to practice his words, to practice his teaching, his ways, and not to practice sin. You know, there's a huge difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing him personally. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. This slide, please. Slide. Here's a guy probably most people in the world know who this is. Who is this? Bill Gates, Bill Gates right? We know a lot about him, right? He's an inventor. He's one of the richest people in the world. I think last time he, he was listed as like number four. He's a co-founder of Microsoft. He's a businessman. Maybe you didn't know he's the founder of the largest charity foundation in the world. And he's considered to be a great philanthropist. In 2010, he started a, the part of the organization, the Giving Pledge, where members pledge to give at least half their wealth to charity. And give it millions and millions and millions of dollars, maybe billions. He's got to be a good man, right? Remember the story about the woman with two mites? Just because of what he's done or doing doesn't mean that he's a good man in God's eyes. Is he a Christian? In interviews, you know, we know that he was brought up in a religious house by all accounts, but in an interview, he said this, 
I think that it makes sense to believe in God. But exactly what decisions in your life that you make differently because of it, I don't know. Then in 2014, he was asked if his charitable work had changed his opinion on religion. And his, this was his response. The moral system of religion, I think, are super important. We've raised our kids in a religious way. And he goes on and on. Then he says, I agree with Richard Dawkins that mankind felt the need for creation myths. And now science has filled in some of the realm that religion used to fill. And if you don't know who Richard Dawkins is, he's a famous British uh, evolutionary biologist and atheist. But what if you're at a fundraiser and Bill, Bill Gates walks up to you and says, Hi, how you doing? My name's Bill Gates. What's yours? Nice to meet you. He doesn't know you, but you know a lot about him, don't you? But you don't have a relationship with him. It's not personal. It's not intimate. Take that to the next level. What if, or are you in a state that when Jesus comes back, or you're at the throne, he might walk up to you and say, Hi, my name's Jesus. What's yours? Nice to finally meet you. Who would agree with me that that's not what you want to hear? You know, who's a good example of this? Verse 23, I'm talking about Judas. He's kind of easy to pick on, right? For three years he hung out with Jesus. He was taught, ate, drank, traveled, was cared for, loved by Jesus, cast out demons, did, did the mighty works. But what did he do in the end? He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. He sold his soul and earned eternal damnation for one month's wage. He was driven by the love of money, not by the love of Jesus. He was a thief. He robbed God. What do we have or do we have anything in our lives that we're selling our soul for? Next slide. We have to ask ourselves, are we robbing God? And I'm not just talking about our, our, our tithing. I mean, I hope that we, you know, we're given as we should. I mean, if you can't be faithful with the easy, simple things, how can we be faithful with the good and hard things? How, how can we expect him to be faithful with us? But I'm not talking so much about that, but are we robbing God of our time and our talents? Or even worse, are we robbing him of our love? Robbing him of the relationship that he desires for each and every one of us. You know, just as Judas chose his own place, so do we. We need to ensure that we're not deceiving ourselves and deceiving God. Well, we can't actually deceive him, right? He knows. He knows us and he knows our hearts. You know, we're called to love God. We've got the greatest commandment. I said it before, right? 2237, Matthew 2237. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You know, people are probably, you know, he's out there preaching and they're looking at him and, and saying, you know, that's easy for you. Life is hard. It's tough. I can't live up to that. Folks, we don't have to. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. You know, there's two great words in the English language. Next time. You can do better the next time. There's two other words that he probably would like to hear is I'm sorry. Repent. It's not hard. Slide, please. You know, when Paul was writing to the Galatians in 4.9, he said, But now you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. How is it you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? He's talking about the things of the world that we prioritize before, over him. But that's the struggle, isn't it? The weakness in our flesh. Slide. We look at Paul again in 1 Corinthians 8.3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. 
If anyone loves God, he is known by him. Does he know you? You know, the bottom line is love really it is the proof. It's the test. The question, are, are we going to pass or are we going to fail that test? You know, the thing is, I don't think God gives out report cards. You know, you check in a box. Uh, uh, attendance in church, A. Forgiving, C. Caring, B. Think of all the other traits that we could add. I'm looking at it and I'm, man, I got a 2.0. C. I pass. No, I think it's a C, isn't it? Yeah, it's a C. You had a 1.0, didn't you? That's right. Grading on a curve. Well, we got this new thing, grading on a curve. But I don't think God grades on a curve, folks. He doesn't grade on a curve, that bell curve. No. I think he does. He gets passed out two grades. Either a P or an F. The problem is that F stands for fire eternal. You know, keeping this mind, are we spiritually awake? Are we spiritually alive? I'm sure here most remember the parable of the ten virgins, right? In Matthew 25, five were faithful, five were foolish. The bridegroom came, and we know that was Jesus, right? And, and all the, the five uh, uh, virgins, they go with him into the feast, and the door gets shut. And then after that happens, the other five, and they come back, and they're knocking on the door saying, open up. And in verse 12, what's Jesus' answer? He says, truly, I do not know you. I say to you, I do not know you. You know, there's plenty of warnings found right here in Scripture. We just have to read it. But we also have to put it into practice. You know, God makes, us, makes the way for us to know him through his son, through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through the Scripture, through our church. Through fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, are, but are we spiritually awake? You know, you remember the ten brides, they, they slept, right? All of them slept, not five and then five. They all slept. We don't have to stay awake 24-7, staring up, looking, waiting. We can't. We're flesh and blood. We're weak. We get tired. We weaken. But are we spiritually awake to the calling that the Lord has on our lives? Spiritually alert to the life that he wants? Part of the problem is, is we treat him as if he isn't important. We treat him as an afterthought. We don't fear him. We don't respect him with the reverence that he deserves and that he demands. We need to stay spiritually alert. We don't know the day or the hour that he's going to return that he may call you home. Let me ask this. How many, everybody here, if you know somebody that died unexpectedly, raise your hand. Look, I think just about everybody's hand is up. And you may be sitting here and you're thinking, Pastor Tom isn't talking about me. He's talking about someone else. That's not me. I hope so-and-so is listening. Our brother, John, John Doe, he should be here to hear this message. I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but who's had those thoughts today or had those kind of thoughts in the past? Maybe, just maybe, we're fooling ourselves and we need to look at that. You know, we come to God's house to worship and honor him, and we don't pay attention. We're not prayed up. We're not prepared. Giving the Lord our undivided attention. We're not in the right frame of mind to allow the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and to guide and bless us. We're worried. You hear the pastors talking about it. We're, you know, going to lunch, the football game. Problems at home, problems at work. Pastor's taking too long. We need to go. What about this? We're addicted to this. Hold on, God. Hold on. I got to text somebody. You know, the thing is, guess what? These things got something called an airplane mode. You can shut them off. But if you're using that, you know, I got a problem if you're using this. Some people use it for their Bible. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't be distracted from hearing God's word and what he's got for you. 
You know, I've asked this question before, and I'll ask it again. Do you love Jesus? If you do, how does he know it? We all need to be asking ourselves that question. You know, we've got, we've got acquaintances. You know, you're in Walmart. You're passing by and saying, hey, how you doing? You know, we've got our friends. We've got our BFS. We've got family. If we claim to be part of the family of God, are we treating God and Jesus like a third cousin twice removed? Or are we treating him as our creator of our Father in heaven who we love, honor, and obey? How much time are we spending reading his word, praying, praising, caring for, and producing for? Are there areas in our lives that we're not putting into practice from his word? Is there things that we're overlooking in his word that we're ignoring? Things that we don't want to do because it's hard, or things in our lives that we shouldn't be doing that we need to be giving up. Folks, we all have a choice. I have a choice. You have a choice to build our lives on his love and share that love with him and with others to love God with all our heart and all that that encompasses. To have a relationship with him and know him. My goal is is not for anyone here to doubt their salvation. I don't want anybody doubting it. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you or touching your heart some of the things, we need to, I want you to evaluate it and I want you to ensure it. <clears throat> or we can choose the ways and practice sin in the ways of the world. And hear, and hear those words, I do not know you, depart from me. Go ahead and start. We're going to do things a little bit differently, but do me a favor and go ahead and stand, and I'm going to pray. We're not going to sing.